Hey there, this is Jacob from Robofoe, here today to talk about the impact of GPT-4 and to make some early speculations on how it's going to change the computer vision industry. So the question we're all asking ourselves is, GPT-4 is this very strong general domain model and it can infer on both text and images now. Is there going to be a need for us to train anymore? Do we need to train computer vision models? Do we need to label data sets? Are we going to have to change the way that we are using machine learning algorithms? And so in this video, we'll kind of dive into GPT-4, what it can do, and what we think the impacts are going to be, and how it's going to change uh, the way that people are working on computer vision problems. So diving in here, um, some of our early speculations on uh, the GPT-4 uh, multimodal capability stem from the power that it has in terms of multimodal semantics. So multimodal semantics is where uh, both uh, texts and images were, uh, were used during the training routines. And these are concepts that are both understood by the model in the same semantic space. So we, we saw some early signs of this uh, with OpenAI's clip model, which was something that we were really excited about at RoboFlow uh, about a couple years ago and didn't seem like too many other people were picking it up. But we've seen multimodal concepts uh, changing the game in other places like stable diffusion, people working on research like uh, data to vec and anything in the generative uh, image space where text and uh, images were kind of working together. Uh, but now the model has learned how to combine these concepts into a strong generative state um, in a way that it never has before. So here's an image of the way the clip featurizer used to work. So the uh, image encoder would go into a similar uh, vector space as a text encoder. They, they were featurized in different uh, featurization spaces, but uh, used to kind of make the same predictions. And so we don't know exactly how GPT-4 was uh, featurizing the images or if it was the same thing as clip, um, but you know we can speculate that some similar research was used to kind of be putting these uh, data inputs into the same space. So why is this so big for, for pre-training? So uh, in, in text domains, pre-training has been um, causing a huge breakthrough in a lot of models all the way since the introduction of BERT where people started to see uh, the BERT transformer just like absolutely setting uh, state-of-the-art records across all these different uh, strong understanding benchmarks. And the reason for this is that text is very semantically rich. So we've come up with all these concepts uh, over time in human history and we've crystallized those into text tokens. And uh, as opposed to images, if you just pre-train on pixels, uh, there's not necessarily those concepts are going to emerge just from the pixels themselves. They need the semantic understanding and the epistemology that people have made uh, into language to really uh, get the, the deep, rich meaning uh, out of those images. And so that's what GP4 has done, is it's figured out how to kind of combine these concepts in a pre-training routine. Um, so that's where a lot of the strong intelligence comes for where GPT-4 is going to be inferring on images. Um, but So what do these APIs exactly look like? So uh, you, you'll be able to infer now with a text uh, input string and an image input, uh, and both of those will be feeding into the model that's then generating a response uh, off of that. So how are multimodal APIs uh, different than what we've previously been doing in computer vision? So in traditional CV models, like an object detection model, you put in one image and you get some structured response out back, like a list of bounding boxes. Now, these multimodal APIs are open-ended because they're generative. So when you query it, you just kind of get some open-ended text back. And so the way you structure the queries, you can try to start getting more uh, structured responses back and maybe making some predictions on those. But um, so that's going to be a little bit different than actually like parsing a JSON and then making some rule-based logic in an app off that. Um, and then, but the other thing though is since it's open-ended, you might be able to skip some of the steps in the business logic that you used to write when you were like um, parsing those, those responses from the more structured model. Um, the other thing that's different is that it's going to be multi-turn. So this means that you don't just query it once, you can query it a few times. So if you're not quite getting uh, the information that you want, you can be going through and trying a few different queries along the way. Another thing that's different is it's zero shot. So this GPT-4 model, does not require any supervised training. You just simply uh, you know, use the pre-trained model and then use the right text prompts uh, to get the predictions that you're looking for. So that's, a, that's another very big difference. So uh, what are the impacts of this GPT-4 general knowledge? So we've been thinking a lot about RoboFlow about how this is gonna change the CV industry. So um, the, the, ta the takeaway point here is that there is some section that GPT-4 is going to obviate, so it's going to be kind of taking over sort of a pillar of general knowledge. And then there's parts of the distribution of computer vision tasks that are more on the edge that require domain knowledge or a certain level of precision that it will not obviate. 
Um, and then there's also um, new things that it's going to unlock. So it's going to unlock new capabilities and ways that we can apply computer vision to the world that we never have before. Um, so diving a little bit more on the, the task that it is going to obviate. So for example, um, anything where imagery is very prevalent on the web that was in the pre-training corpus for the GP4 training is going to be uh, easily answered and um, worked with by the model. So for example, you probably will never need to train a model anymore that will say identify the different species of dog. Um, that's just something the model knows and it's going to be loaded fully into its memory. Other examples might be whether there's smoke present in, it, in an image or uh, reading numbers, the, the GP4 model can do a pretty good OCR job off a document and then summing them. It could just kind of do that all in one step. So th those are some of the things where we can see GP4 making um, a big impact on, on things that it's going to take over in terms of the general knowledge. And then as these models get stronger, that realm sort of just keeps widening out as they're able to draw more connections and fit more uh, into their inference capabilities. So things that are going to be difficult for GP4. Um, so anything where there is a specific domain uh, data or proprietary information that the model hasn't seen is going to be out of scope for the model. So this is anything like a specific machine part on a factory floor, or maybe you have like a commercial fishing ship and you have a specific species of fish that uh, is under your boat that really isn't present in web imagery. Um, you know, that you might be able to figure out some sort of prompts along the way to try to tease GP4 into giving you what you want, but it might not have the, the kind of specific domain knowledge that you'll be able to have in your proprietary uh, control. Um, and so that, that's where GP4 will uh, remain uh, not as good as uh, training a model. Um, so what are the new applications that GP4 unlocks? So it will unlock um, new uh, open domain problems that we previously just haven't had, you know, the labeling bandwidth or the ability to see around every corner of the thing that the model is going to need. Um, for example, like the first app that OpenAI is partnering with is giving another sense to uh, the blind so they can see the things that are in their uh, surroundings from another angle, like through, through the text that the model is going to be sending back to them. Um, but you could imagine something like we have a security camera, camera generally monitoring things um, and some of these more like open-ended uh, apps that uh, probably I can't even imagine right now are going to be emerging off uh, the GPT-4 capability. Um, so what are some areas that are unknown? The things that we don't know yet. So the APIs are not public yet, so we haven't been able to actually hit them and just have been looking at demos and speculating on how strong this is going to be. Um, we don't know how good it is at localization, counting, or things like pose estimation. Some of these very specific and precise uh, inferences, um, we are not sure how well the model is going to be able to do at that. And this is because uh, traditionally um, transformers haven't been as good as CNNs of uh, doing some of these tasks. And then also, it's not clear from, you know, like next word prediction if some of these concepts are going to be locked into the model, but we'll have to see. Um, next, so what is going to be the things holding GP4 back from adoption and production? So there's a few things. So the first thing is image inference cost. So um, these models are huge. So it's kind of like bringing in a sledgehammer. You know, you're going to be bringing in a sledgehammer to um, to crack a nut, basically, in some cases. Like, if you just want to count the number of people in an image, you could pull a, a model that's been trained to detect people, and you could use a small CNN that's uh, 20 megabytes in size versus running some, you know, trillion parameter model to make the inference. And so these inferences are going to be pretty costly. Um, the, the cost is uh, 3 cents per 750 word prompt, and we think that an image is going to be somewhere around, like, half the full context of the model, so we're thinking maybe, like, 12 cents a call right now, um, which is pretty prohibitive. Uh, for a lot of images, especially if you have uh, high high throughput of images you need inferenced. Um, but, you know, with Moore's Law, that'll eventually come down. But that's going to be something that will be holding it back, and maybe is even why they haven't uh, released those API endpoints yet. Another one is uh, the inference latency. So um, when you po po post an image up into the cloud, there's a latency in that cloud uh, data transfer. But then also, the model's so large, it'll take a little while uh, for it to infer. So that might be half a second or a second before you get a response back, which might be too slow for certain apps. Certainly anything that runs on the edge in real time will not be able to be inferred on GP4. The other thing is privacy concerns. So when you post up to this API, you'll have to be sending your data into the OpenAI servers, which certain enterprises uh, won't be all right with, and, and they'll want to own their own model. Uh, so in that case, you know, people will still be training models uh, to be you know, deployed into our own uh, servers and our own data centers.
Um, so in conclusion, um, GPT-4 is this new, very strong general model, and it's going to change a lot of the ways that we work with computer vision, and it's going to unlock all sorts of new things that we can do with it. Um, its adoption will be slowed down a little bit by uh, various concerns with its cost to deploy and its latency and privacy concerns, but overall there'll be a lot of new things that uh, it will be doing. So um, we think that you know multimodal AI is going to change a lot of things, and we think it's going to make our business better in a lot of ways, and we're excited to be building with it, and uh, we hope you are too. And so, uh, as we always say, happy inference, and in this case, happy training, uh, sometimes. So we'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much.